mythology and role models for them. Now, when we speak of Indian mythology, women in Indian mythology, we are talking specifically today. And when we speak of Indian mythology, it's replete with women, you know, so many of them. But uh, it is also true that uh, the mythology is dominated by men. So, uh, and uh, we mostly have them as the central figures. And maybe Koran, you can tell us about that. Do you think that women in Indian mythology are more or less there for the backstories or to push the narrative forward? Can you say that? No, I would never say that. The way uh, I perceive mythology, or uh, everybody can perceive it, it's not something that we, I do or I should do. Uh, these are stories with different kinds of characters finding place and playing their role. It is not about domination of one kind of character or glorification of one kind of character. But yes, in due course of time, the, our society has been extremely patriarchal. So when the society is patriarchal, they tell the stories in a particular way. They tell the stories glorifying men as great warriors, glorifying men as uh, brave kings, and putting the women in the sideline, because that suited their perspective. It was not that mythology was created like that. We created it. Now, in Indian mythology, we see uh, See, we have god and goddesses, we are speaking in English. But we have uh, Bhagwan and then the female goddesses are Ma. So when we throw them as Ma or Mai or Amma, it comes with all the sacrifices, the pain, the agony that goes into becoming a mother. She's the provider, she's the giver. And as we read Indian mythology and we study the women in there, we see that they have faced a lot of patriarchy, a lot of misdemeanor. A lot of humiliation, a lot of pain. So, so much so that it sometimes seems that all this has set the narrative of how women should be right up to here in this society. How do you see that? Thank you for that very interesting question. Uh, like Oral pointed out, it's not the fault of uh, Indian mythology at all. Indian mythology has been weaponized by a very patriarchal society to uh, just promote one kind of narrative which is highly limiting as you pointed out. Uh, you know, slotting a woman as uh, either a Madonna figure or a whore. Like you have that very uh, strict dichotomy. So you are either a mother, if I see you that way, I will worship you. I will place you on a pedestal, I will hold you to impossible standards and I will worship you. But if I judge you to be a whore, then you will be stoned to death. It's what you can expect from me. So it's such a problematic narrative and I've always taken issue with the fact that they point to mythology and use that to treat women badly. Because mythology I think is very very empowering for women. Because you now you take someone like Ganga and uh, I've written a book on her and every time say Ganga Ma, Ganga Ma, Ganga Ma but she, was so, she has so many faces to her she's so much more than that she's so spirited, she's so feisty and she's not afraid to pursue her desire she's not afraid to go where her wild and willful heart leads her and women are discouraged from doing that but when, because when it comes to men expressing their desires it's sanctioned by society, it's legitimized but when it's women expressing their, their desire, somehow they are villainized, crucified, punished for it. And yet if you take Goddess Ganga, she chose satisfaction over sacrifice every step of the way. She was approached to perform penance and she's also the daughter of Himavan. Patati and Ganga are sisters. So she's the elder one. She was approached by the gods to uh, you know, perform penances and win the hand of Shiva to make him give up his Adi Yogi ascetic ways to return to the householder's path. But Ganga said, no, why should I? Do you want to spend thousands of years doing penances? I don't. She said, uh, uh, you know, let him perform penances to win my hand. I'm worth it. So they call her the crooked one. But she's so hot. She's so sexy when she does that, no? <laughs> We are women are don't play the sacrifice card. Why? Sacrifice is boring. Satisfaction is fun. And then she dared to fall in love with Mahabisha. 
not many people know that uh, you know uh, she fell in love with this king, a mortal, and apparently love between a mortal and an immortal is forbidden. And Ganga said, forbidden to you maybe, not to me. I go where my heart leads me. I love Mahabasha, and you know Mahabasha was being born as Shantanu. Yeah, that's where the story begins. So it's like Ganga getting her way, whichever you know, however it goes, and she was asked to bear the children of. Uh, uh, Shantanu to release the Vasus. Imagine asking a woman to bear a child and then cast the child into the waters. Everyone will call you, they will call you. The women will get slaughtered as a whore. That itself they use this license to kill you. Imagine if you are seen as a whore and a murderer. They asked her to do that. She was willing to do it because you know destiny has a bigger plan. And Gaga was willing to do it. But in return she also, uh, you know the way I interpret it, so, there are some versions that suggest that, uh, you know, in return for this, Ganga asks that she be given something because she always chooses the satisfaction of a sacrifice. So, she said she wanted a love that is perfect, a love which has all the pleasure and none of the pain. So, they say, uh, you know, she was granted her desire, and they, in some versions, it suggested that Radha is an incarnation of Ganga. And she gets to enjoy the rustly love. <laughs> that perfect love, because Krishna is the perfect lover. No so I'm going to pull some messed up stunt on you and screw you over and leave you in tears. So that's Ganga for you. And that's not stories I'm making up. If you do your research, you study Indian mythology, it is such an empowering narrative. And that is what we try to reclaim. You know, we are not making up these stories. We just get to the heart of it and we restore women to their rightful position as badasses, <laughs> not sacrificial goats. No, that's not who we are. Purima, if I were to ask, if I were to ask you, do you think in Indian mythology, since we are also saying that we are looking for role models in India from Indian mythology, so do you see that Indian mythology sets too high a standard for women in terms of her biasness, in terms of her, you know? Obedience, the virtues that she is supposed to have. Do you think the standards are a bit too high? So the standards are what you choose it to be. Standards are what I choose it to be. If I decide I want to be a writer, I want to be an author, I go ahead and do it. If I want to be an engineer, I go ahead and do it. I have done my postgraduate in engineering electronics. Engineering, I worked in three MNCs, but I quit it because I wanted to be with my son. It's what it's my narrative, it's my life. And today if I want to be an author, totally changing streams, it's what I decide. So Indian mythology is not that. So you ask uh, questions to Koral and to uh, Anuja. I want to add on to both of it. So how many of you know this shloka? Asatoma sad kamaya, tamasoma jyote kamaya, mrityoma amritam kamaya. You, you all know this shloka. Do you know that this shloka is from the Brihadaranya Upanishad? And it's a dialogue between Maitreyi and her husband Yagnavalkya. We don't know this, it's the narrative. Today the society has changed into a patriarchal society. The mythology was not that. The ancient Treta Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, Satya Yuga was not a patriarchal society. The men were equal. We talk about Rani Lakshmi Bai today because she was a great warrior. We talk about warriors, women warriors. You might remember that Kaili was a warrior. Yes. You might remember Mahasita for her, you know, uh, Patibrata, she was a great woman, saintly woman, chast, chast woman. Of course, chastity is another subject which uh, Anja has talked about sufficiently. But do you know that Mahasita was a warrior? Lord Rama killed the ten-headed Ramana, but Mahasita slayed the thousand-headed Ramana, then Lord Rama swooned, he fainted in the battlefield. Mahasita is a warrior who is more, who is, she is more powerful than Lord Rama. Do you know uh, Draupadi was a financial expert? She was playing a major role in Hastinapura's, uh, not in not Matya, in Indraprastha. She was a great lawyer. You might remember this dialogue she asked, did my husband put me on the uh, gamble after he lost or before he lost because that makes a big, big, big change, big difference. So does the ancient scripture hold women to great standards and we are supposed to aim it? No. You be what you want to be. You follow your heart. Somebody asked me, are you a writer? 
Are you not a writer? Are you a ghost writer? Are you an editor? What is your standards? Where do I place you? I am who I desire to be. I am an expert, so be it. I am a novice, so be it. I am a student, so be it. I am who I am. And you are who you are. Follow your heart. So, whether it is ancient scriptures, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, Satya Yuga, Dvita Yuga, Dvapara Yuga, Kali Yuga, if you decide to be in a patriarchal system, you should think, break it free and just be who you are, follow your heart. Thank you. Good. You know, <laughs> good uh, information is coming and flowing to all of you here, but I will still come back to what I asked you initially, you know. Ram could have been just a warrior king had it not been for uh, Kekre or Sita and the stories which come after him. Uh, Bhishma Pitamaha wouldn't have been a Bhishma Pitamaha had it not been for women like Satyabhama, Amba, Varika and all those things. Draupadi, of course, played a massive role. The battle of Kurushet wouldn't have been there. But somehow, you know, the stories of the men are very simple and straight. But the stories of women are extremely, extremely intricate and very complicated, whether it is Kunti or whether it's Ahilya, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, we can take some Gandhai from where she was coming, why she did that power and things like that. So do you think that this is also a form of a patriarchy, you know, where the men get very simple and straight. Women has become very, very complicated with so many, uh, you know, uh, angles being put. Their, their stories are very admirable, you know, I mean, if you go there, into there, into there, into there. How would you say that? that? That makes it very difficult to understand women in Indian mythology. Uh, I think it's very difficult to understand women everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just take this away from mythology and explain after, before coming back to mythology. If you look at society, men's world, women's world, initially, when people started working, I mean, professional jobs, right? There was a division of labor. Women stayed at home because such was the anatomical requirement maybe it was easier for them to stay at home, do the household chores and put their entire effort there. Men went out to work and uh, do the outside work. Right? This was not a division of labor that happened because of talent, merit, choice. It was just the convenience, right? Now, women stay at home, try to understand that in one house, we are the four of us. Out of that, Purnima says that, okay, I'll go out and work, she's a man. She goes out and meets these people. Now, Purnima is with these people, right? She has the support of these people, she knows that they are their they are friends. <coughs> we three are just we three. So, our world has become smaller than what it could have been. Her world has become bigger, right? Now, she with all these people decide, these three are students. They don't know anything. They don't even come out. They don't know what is the problem outside. Now, in order to go and do that, attend to that problem outside, you come home, get your food, get a good night's sleep. For that, we three are looking. That is one question. Second perspective is, our world is just the three of us. Right? So, our Domestic work is just the three of us. For Purnima, there's a work world outside. She leaves and comes back home to eat and sleep. Yeah. Her domestic world is far more subtle. Professionally, she goes out there, talks to them, works, has fun, has a cup of tea, comes back home. Entertainment plus work. For us, our work is also the three of us. When she has to have a professional library, <coughs> this is our population. For three of us, we are the rivals. Our world is also the three of us, right? And then someone from here will stand up and say women are women's worst, worst enemies. They will be no black and white. When she has to go out there, she has out of this population of 100, if I may consider, there will be 20 idols. For us, we three are the only idols. And they will be saying that women are women's worst enemies. That is patriarchy. That is the kind of things that patriarchy brings to the table mm -hmm. and explains women with some kind of, uh, you know, derogation, derogatory influence. When it comes to mythology, the same thing happens. It is the way you look at the stories, 
It is all very portrayed in In patriarchal storytelling, you show men as achievers and women as those in the periphery who come forward, do something stupid, and so big wars happen, people die. Who asked Sita to come out of the Lashman River? Sita came out to give arms to someone who was complaining of hunger. That person deceived Sita. It was not Sita, it was that person who deceived Sita because of whom the great war happened and people died. Right? right? It is the same across all versions, all women's stories that are there in mythology. But then, when you try to tell the story from the men's perspective, you show men as achievers and women as foolish peripheral characters who are coming in, causing some disruption, causing some trouble, creating a drama. <laughs> now, in order to handle that, how do you handle that? You see women as the problem, right? And when there is a problem, what is the obvious alternative? You solve the problem. If you have to solve the problem, what do you do? You correct the woman because woman is the problem. <laughs> So obviously, as in a bed, as in a chalo, as in a bed, as in a muskra, what are you ready to do? Jari, what are you ready to do? A whole lot of politics gets shaped up. Which happens in mythology as well. What actually shapes women in every generation, every kind of horizon, not just mythology, is something called leadership, which is eternal, which is spiritual, which is not something that anybody else can do. It is about your learning from the various experiences that you have gone through. And what fascinates me is there are situations when you are at the top, when you are in between somewhere, juggling with the uh, with in general people who are not necessarily making a difference but existing, trying to go to the top. When you are at the top and when you are at the bottom, when you are at the top, you are an achiever. What do you become? That creates your life. The most complicated way. Your relationship with self more than everybody else because that defines what you will do to others. And when you are in the position of adversity, when failures have bogged you down and you are right at the bottom, what do you do? How bitter has you, have you become? Or are you still crying? That defines your life. That you get to see in women again and again. In men, you see, we have defined success as. Some people who are out there battling, winning. We have not understood success as a work in progress. <coughs> Women constantly show that, that I have been pushed to the corner, properly mm -hmm. in that court. What happens to her after? Has she lost herself? Mm -hmm. Did she commit suicide? Did she give it up? That name is her name over. When Sita was kidnapped, what happened? Was she afraid? Had she given on that day to Ravan? When Ravan was threatening her that Rama is gone, you are in Lanka, you have nobody with you, better marry me. Had Sita on that day thought that actually I don't see Rama anywhere, this is Ravan's land, I am trapped, let me go and marry Rama and finish it off. Ramayana would have ended there. The war wouldn't be required. It would have, it was Sita who took it forward. Took it forward. Otherwise, the war wouldn't have been required, right? Rama would have been lost without the war. Uh, as Kodil has explained very, very nicely and in very detail, there, there were fighters, etc. But even though those who wrote the scriptures, somewhere, you know, they decided to get kind to the women and they tried to level it and equalize it. Like Sita ups and gives up everything. Who she says she goes down back to Mother Earth. <laughs> After all that suffering, that's a statement by itself. Okay, we have Manzodri, who, in her, uh, you know, the way she talks to her husband, she somehow tries to balance all the evil that was surrounding Ra. <laughs> so, there's somewhere the writers, you know, they try to bring the balance, you know, <coughs> Did I say Draupdi? Yeah. So Draupdi, you know, she also has her reasons, you know, she talks a lot about them. You know. So, uh, do you think that somewhere they also, the scriptures also, the writers of the scriptures have also tried to balance the narrative, you know, in some form, by giving them some meaning somewhere? 
See, uh, when it comes to this uh, writing process which you talk about, uh, I think uh, writers are not as much in control as we think. You know, because the narrative, sometimes we just go with the flow, we just blend in with the pattern, we try to capture something that's authentic. So you're just part of the process and I think balance is a huge part of that process. It's not you who made the balance happen. The balance is there anyway. Which is why personally I do not uh, subscribe to this extremely simplistic, uh, problematic view where you see everything in black and white, in dichotomies. Good inevitably triumphs over evil. No, that's not how it works in real life. That is not what Indian mythology is about. Good triumphing over evil. That's not at all how it is. And it's also not about uh, you know men and women. It, every discussion, every question doesn't have to come down to whether you have breasts, whether you have balls, whether you stand up to pee or whether you sit down and pee. I don't know why we feel the need to keep returning to this man versus woman narrative. Because, uh, see, we worship Shiva and Shakti in their Ardhanari Shari form. We can all agree that men and women are equal but different. Everybody knows it. And men cannot do without women, women cannot do with men. There are other genders out there. It's a whole world out there. There are so many issues, but we always, you know, view the ethics our Indian mythology through the lens of man versus women. Did women get a raw deal? Is it patriarchy? No, I think you have to go past that narrative to truly understand the essence of what's being conveyed. Now you mentioned Sita getting kidnapped. We talked about how she propelled the narrative, how she brought about the will of destiny. The story is more complicated than that. We talked about her returning to the earth after suffering. But why view it in terms of suffering and uh, pleasure alone? Because if you actually get the root of that story, uh, there's another story within a story in our ethics, right? So why why did all this happen? Why was Rama separated from Sita? Why did he suspect her? What was that all about? You know, because they are of course perfect. If you look a little deeper, the story is that uh, you know in another age, Brigu Munivar, Brigu Rishi's wife was killed by Vishnu. She fought on the side of the Asuras because her friend was uh, you know, uh, the mother of the Asuras. She asked Vibhu Muniva's wife to intervene because Vishnu fights on the side of the Devas. She said, restore the balance, the balance you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So here you have Vishnu, he needed an equal. Mm -hmm. And to stop her, he asked her, she froze the Devas. Legend has it that she froze them with, her, the, with the might of her ascetic power. Mm -hmm. And the Asuras started slaying the Devas. Mm -hmm. And Vishnu said, it's not fair. You're not giving them a chance to defend themselves. She said, when you being fair, when you tilted the, the scales in their favor, she refused to back off. A woman refusing to back off. And Vishnu had her decapitated. He released his Darshana Chakra and he killed a good woman who was doing the right thing. And Brigu Munivar pointed that out. He said, you did what you thought was right. My wife did the same. How dare you kill her? You will pay the price for it. You will know what it's like to be separated from your wife, to lose her. You know, Vishnu accepted it. He said, you're right, you're right. I agree. What I did here, you know, and the punishment, I will accept it. And Lakshmi immediately steps up. She says, I will accept the punishment with you. This was a decision made by Vishnu and Lakshmi. Rama and Sita did not have a clue about it. But it happened that way. That's the story here. Cause and effect, cause and effect. The working of destiny is complicated, it's nuanced, it often escapes our understanding. What we get if we are lucky is glimpses of this beauty and truth, which is what we should be going after. We should put our efforts towards uncovering beauty and truth and we need not limit ourselves always to men did this to me, men are the oppressors. We don't need men to save us and we don't need to cast them as villains either. Because at the end of the day, you know, a woman's voice cannot be silenced. Men can never prevail over women and it works the other way too. So why do we always return to the same argument? Why women, you know, we are victims of crimes, they disrobed us. So what? Draupadi got disrobed. So what? She's tough enough to move on. She didn't cry in one corner for the rest of her life. And she didn't limit her, her you know, role in this universe to the fact that she was disrobed, that she was menstruating at the time. She was a powerful woman, she was a player on the political stage and I think that is what it is for all women. We can move past the bad things that happen. 
we need not be limited to what the men in our lives have done to us or done for us. They love us, hate us, whatever, who cares. We exist past that man. So that's, that is the truth here. That is the balance we are talking about. That there are greater things we can think about. And we need not always talk about man versus woman, man versus woman, man versus woman. Purima, uh, do you think the women in Indian mythology can be explored in this manner? by women who are reading it about them today. Today's educated Kathleen woman. Can she explore the women from the Indian mythology by setting the standards that we have for ourselves in today's society? Can she explore what? The role Indian models. models. So you, you are asking about role models in Indian mythology? Yeah. For today's women? For today's women. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to repeat the same thing. Uh, we, had, we have this Prahla Ranya Upanishad Shloka and I think, you know, we don't, many of us don't know that it was a dialogue between Maitri and Yagnavalkya. It was a woman who wrote that in the Rig Veda. And do you know there is Loka Mudra, who is the wife of Agastya. She is credited with four hymns, uh, maybe I'm wrong or right, I don't know, but she has written part of Rig Veda. And then there is Gargi. Gandhi is a great sage, she was in the court of uh, King Janaka. She was the only one, again, like Anuja said, moving beyond the narrative of man and woman. She was the only single one person who could hold Yamna Valkya at stead. She was the only person, I'm not saying man, woman, she was the only person who defeated Yamna Valkya in a debate, in a debate of Vedas, in a debate of a dialogue about the soul, about God realization. I'm talking about God realization. I'm not even talking about war, victory, um, family life, economics, politics. Uh, of course, nobody was a great politician uh, or Sita. Or she, I'm talking about God realization, about great spiritual goals. So, Gargi, Maitreyi, Yagnavalkya's wife was Maitreyi. Loka Mudra was Agastya's wife. So, I'm using this word wife of, wife of, because we know these people, these men, so that, you know, it's only an identification. If I'm called Purnima Ramakrishnan, it's an identification, probably if there is somebody in your Purnima Chandramauli, say. So it's an identification, you use the man's, uh, it can as well be Ramakrishnan Purnima, or, you know, my father's name is Ramakrishnan, actually he can be called, but I think he was born before me. So, Role model, women role models are there abundantly, but I would like to say, as Anuja said, we only want role models. We don't want men or women role models. And then I will go one more step ahead. You are your own role model. You are your own best version today. And you are going to go to the bestest version which you can possibly be tomorrow, the day before your death. The day of death for you is going to be the best version of yourself. That is the role model you should aspire to be. I'm not going to aspire to be Koral Das Gupta or Anuja and vice versa. Nobody is going to aspire to be each other. I'm going to aspire to be my own best role model. So that's going to be my takeaway from this birth, which I have taken in this world today. Thank you. I want to know. Why are women writers exploring these stories so much now? You know, we have quite a few of you all who are writing about them. There is a need, you know, to reinterpret these characters from the world. You know, uh, we have different stages of life. Initially, when we are born, we are into this stage of believing. He will try to believe and he will ask for the person to reinforce whatever you are saying in order to believe. Then there is a stage when you ask questions and that is the longest stage where you are constantly challenging, asking, curious, right? And that is the longest stage of a life. And then there is a stage when you are sitting and thinking. Everything, every input that has gone into your mind and that is when you have too many questions that you are asking internally. And that is when your subconscious is written in answers. Subconscious is everybody's vision. That is just a, a preference. But when you look into the, at my stage, or at Anuja's stage, at Purnima's stage, we have seen a lot 
our life experiences have taught us a lot of things. We have seen pain, we have seen happiness, we have explained a lot of things with words which we have chosen to use in those situations. Probably my pain, I could say in particular words, I would explain differently, right? It's our perspective. Now when we look at the stories, the questions that we have, we try to go back into our stories, into our history, our culture, and none of us want to stick to one point, you know. I as a person, I'm a very small person, just one person. Female, being female is only one part of my being. I don't want to restrict. I don't want to be a woman only. I don't want to be a mother only. I don't want to be a Bengali only. I don't want to be an Indian only. I don't want to be just a part of this world. I belong to the universe. Is there anything bigger than the universe? Must be. I belong there as well. Now, when I am trying to expand, Right? And I have too many questions that I have acquired all my life and I'm trying to go back and to find answers in my subconscious. That is my intellectual pursuit. And that is everybody's intellectual pursuit. Where at some point of time we ask ourselves, who am I and where do I come from? And we start going back to it. We go back to history. We don't find answers. We find the same questions staring back at us. And we keep going back to figure out, yeah, I have answered. Answer should have answered. And there is one thin line where you skip from history to mythology because mythology is the history of every generation it applies with every person be it karma, be it urgent, be it robbery, be it you know, everybody man, woman, uh, irrespective will find a representation of these kind of things so today is one such time when we have evolved into that stage of thinking where we are able to look at gender relationships and the truth of gender in a far more open way. Maybe we don't get to follow those in our lives, but we have this realization that when we heard the stories as a child, I'm a student of economics. Okay? I'm a student of economics. The first story that I heard when I was a child was from my grandparents. The most trusted people, I loved them the most. And they started storytelling with, and it is the truth of everybody, not just me. They started telling me the story as Ayodhya me bohat bada raja. Raja ke teen wife, teen bivi. With my economics brain, when I interpret it, the man is entitled to three years, the woman is entitled to XY3. So the man's entitlement is 2.5 times more than the woman's entitlement. Is she story is shunna sunna chalati. So our gender narratives, the conditioning has started building. And now we are at a time, all of us, where we know that when you listen to these stories in these fashion, and then at some point of time you grow up 16, 17, 18, a beautiful world called fem feminism you see. Okay. And you want to be feminist because that is very cool. You become activists. You don't become victims. We are all of us trying to make sense, pushing ourselves away from the activism and becoming people. And that is when we try to go further back, back, back. And history shows you know, the mythology we have just done. And we are trying to find the answer that hopefully, happily, we are getting the answers. So, एक राजा की तीन वाइफ्स थी, दो थी कि पांच हस्बैंड्स थे। ठीक हो बोला? शुरुआत में हमें बोला है बोला रहा था कि जब वो बेटा सुनो हम मेरी कहानी, पहली कहानी हम बता रहे हैं बता रहे हैं रॉबर्ट की फाइट करें। You know, as Anjali was saying, that this is not about gender fight. We love men, trust me. We love men, and men love women. Yeah. Yeah. It is not about basically giving you a part as men. The point is. Explaining, putting it into perspective. What was the samajik person? What was the society? Why was it important? And who was he? My child, they were mobile. <laughs> uh, when my son was smaller, I had asked him who is your favorite female character in mythology. And he was like, you know, what kind of question is that? Female character in mythology is your favorite female man. He had no understanding of each question. I had to answer each question. And that was an eye-opening. No, that was not eye-opening. 
second question was on. Is it just Eka Nathur? Is it Sita? Oh. I said, Kyo Sita? Sita is obedient. Oh. And I was like, I am here. I don't know if you like Sita Rati Baal Manta. Is this Sita Baal Achiya? I have to do something. Are you telling me? What do you think of all things you get, especially from your favorite readers, you know, when they read your books? What have your experiences been about the books that you're writing? Again, for me, I never try to, you know, I, I don't see myself as writing about women in Indian mythology. I just write about Indian mythology. And anyone who knows me will tell you the great love of my life is Arjuna. Uh, hands down. You know, the great love of my life is Arjuna. So, and I've not written only about Ganga and Mohini and Shakti. I've written about Kamadeva. I've written about Kartikeya. I've written about Abhimanyu. So, you know, it's not a man-woman thing at all. Uh, for me, it, it, it just comes down very simply to the fact that I love the stories. I love these stories, and uh, that is my uh, that's the love affair which I've always invested a lot in. My husband would be happy to hear it because I am a bit of a commitment phobic, and you know it takes a lot uh, for me to commit. And I know that for life I will commit to these stories. That you know, uh, I love that uh, India has such a rich tradition of storytelling. That these stories have been handed on from generation to generation. We're talking 3,000 plus years over right here. And I feel like I'm just contributing to it in a small way, in a tiny way. I'm just part of that storytelling process. And the response from women, you know, they call, uh, they come from a feminist perspective, and they say it was a comfort. Victims of abuse approach me. They tell me I felt empowered after reading your books. The trans community has uh, written to me. The LGBTQ community have approached me and said, I wish I had this book while growing up. And interestingly, lots of men respond to this and they say, I thought you were anti male. I thought you were a feminazi. But you're not like that. You're not like that. And they love the passion and the love in my stories. I'm only surprised because you also have certain prejudices, biases. And I'm only surprised that men love the love. In my books. So I would never have seen it that way myself. They love the passion. And they say I love that. So you never know what kind of response you get, and that's just part of the gift. You don't expect it when you're writing. They say, oh, I think it was Bernard Shaw who said, write drunk and edit sober. <laughs> I'm not asking you guys to take, take up alcoholism or anything. I'm just saying I'm part of the flow. There's a surrender here, and I never know what to expect. And I'm happy not knowing. Because, uh, you know, uh, what you get from what you write is not important. Writing itself, itself is its own reward. Yeah. And I feel, like Purima said, I feel very privileged to be able to do something that I love. That's all. Thank you. Purima, I want to sum up very, very quickly. Do you think the way these uh, uh, writers, I'm sorry, no <coughs> writers, the way uh, mythology is being reinterpreted now, you know, in the modern times, do you think it, it, it puts the younger generation in gives them another perspective, they can learn from it, there are takeaways from it, you know, if they study the way these women are integrating my thoughts. So, uh, I'll tell you one thing. Um, I had a session today morning uh, with children, with students, sorry, not children, with students. And uh, we spoke about the story uh, where Bhagiratna brought down uh, Ma Ganga to earth. And when we were talking about it, all the students, they set goals for themselves, career goals, and uh, they wrote down how they are going to achieve their goals. And you know, there is this phrase, Bhagiratha Prayatna, right? That originated from this story. And then we spoke about SMART goals, S-M-A-R-T. SMART goals means specific, measurable, you, you guys may know this, specific, measurable, um, achievable, realistic, time bound. So when you speak about how mythology is relevant or writers create relevance of mythology, I would like to say that there is abundant wisdom and you don't need one writer from contemporary times to come and tell you, oh, see this relevance. You can take Bhagiratha's story and set up goals for yourself and you can create this contemporary relevance for today's times. No, you don't need somebody like Koral Kutubima or Anuja to tell you that. Just go. Do your own thing, be your own self, take inspiration from wherever it is coming from. Whether it's from mythology, whether it's from contemporary, whether it's from some Bollywood hero. I would just say the world is the universe, Kural said a beautiful thing. If there is something beyond this universe, I want to be part of that. 
If you can take inspiration from somewhere out there, out of creation itself, take inspiration from there. And believe me, it's accessible to you. So there is, you know, just expand your horizons. Your mind is the best. It's so vast. It's just break your boundaries, break your shackles. You don't need four people sitting here and having this conversation for you to feel inspired. You are your own inspiration. Like I said, the day before you die, that is the bestest version you're going to be. And as for you to go there, that is your benchmark. That is your insee that insee or she. That is the person you have to be inspired. So I will leave you with that and I want you to remember that you have to become the bestest, 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 bestest. I think I saw this in Aishwarya Rai's Instagram. S S S S S version of yourself. So that's it from me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Festival, uh, the Raisani group as well, and thank you, Bhargavata, for having us all here. So, before the closing the sessions, so guys, do you have any uh, questions to these beautiful ladies? <laughs> yeah, please. Intelligent wise ladies. <laughs> I like beautiful also. But we have to wrap up, okay? You just you can ask, but we will have to wrap up because yeah. of time. Here. Yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I'm Natasha, I'm an alumni from the Bangalore, and it's my first time in, in your presence, and it's a pleasure to be here. So, my question was, how to find the actual truths in mythology, as in what knowledge or ancestors really wanted to share with us, uh, with the help of mythological stories? For example, Echo and Narcissus, uh, it's from Roman mythology, we can figure out that it's based on the topic of psychology, the relationship between an actor and narcissist. So I wanted to know more about that. Thank you so much. Echo and narcissist. Echo and narcissist. Yeah. I'm with a narcissist. You see, uh, you were talking about getting to the truth contained in these yeah, yeah. things, right? And echo and narcissist is also Greek mythology. There's so, there's, it's very, very nuanced. They say that, I think Oscar Wilde put it best, he said the love of the self is the beginning of a lifelong romance. Mm -hmm. You know, and we are encouraged not to love ourselves. Like I said, we have to, you know, be strict with ourselves, we are harsh with ourselves. But, uh, you know, the, the moral of the story is a uh, balance again. If you fall too much in love with yourself, that's screwed up. You have to love yourself just right. Balance is key, like Baka was telling earlier. Balance is key. Love yourself, but don't become sick with self love. Mm -hmm. That's the point of the narcissist story. So, with the stories, whether it's Indian mythology, Greek, you just uh, have to strip away the fripperies and get to the heart of it. And that comes from personal <laughs> effort. It's a personal journey, and the journey is always more fun than the destination. Mm -hmm. It's a personal journey. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, I'm a student of history, so I'd like to ask you a question that uh, by reading Vedic feminism, I've come to know some aspects of it. So, what do you think that one can uh, idealize some points of Vedic feminism in its uh, own life to improve it? So, I'll tell you one dialogue from the Rig Veda. Since you said Vedic feminism, uh, I'm going to paraphrase it in English. Lopa Mudra is the wife of Agastya. So he goes away to the forest for doing penance. He leaves her alone and he goes away and he says, No, family life is not for me. I'm, I'm a sage, I'm a great rishi, I'm a weaver, and you know, that's it. And Lopa Mudra goes back to him, and this is, I'm quoting from the Rig Veda. He, uh, she tells him, Family life is important. Like Bhatta said, balance. You need to, you know, strive for God realization, but you also need to fulfill your duties to your wife. You can't abandon your wife, you can't abandon your family. And then he comes back because he sees the wisdom in her dialogue. He sees the wisdom in, her, in that conversation. So he comes back, he leads the family life, they have a son, and that son goes on to become a great sage himself, and that's an entirely different story. But I'm quoting from the Rig Veda. So when you say 
your question, I think, what was his question? Vedic. Vedic feminism. So, uh, of course, we all three of us would like to move away from feminism, but uh, coming to your question directly, there is so much of feminism in from the Vedic times. Lopa Mudra was actually given to Agastya to, take, to be taken care of as a child. She grew up and then they permitted them to get married. Brahma permitted this marriage. So, you know, coming back to your question, I mean, I think you got your answer right. <laughs> yeah, it's right there. So, you just need to dig deeper and answers just really. Like she said, the journey is important. When you perceive it yourself, it's like, oh, aha. That aha is your journey. And if I tell you everything, no. You should read Rigveda. I want you to have your aha. Sure.